talks lined up for you, um, beginning with Dr. Andrew Reardon, who's going to explain a little bit about, he's had billions of years experience of <laughs> treating kids with meningitis and septicemia and knows everything there is to know about the disease and how it happens and how kids are left with the problems that they're left with. So he can answer questions as well during the break about that sort of thing. Um, so he, he's going to kick off. And um, then Sean Falder, who's here somewhere, is yeah, going, going to yeah. <laughs> talk about um, sort of the skin management issues with help from some of her colleagues, I think. Um, then Fergal Monsell, who's from Bristol, is going to talk about some of the other kind of bone complications that you get with meningococcal septicemia. Um, some of these things don't manifest themselves until a few years after you know, the child has had the disease and, and has recovered and so on. So quite an interesting, Fergal's done some really fantastic work with us before, both in terms of um, telling us how things work and also yeah. in terms of um, campaigning for vaccines and things. So, um, and uh, then after the break, Natalie Holman is going to be talking about um, psychological effects and Richard Copson, who I don't think is here yet, is going to be talking be talking about issues around entitlement, so some of the legal issues around entitlement to care and support and so on. So uh, without further ado then, Andrew, um, please come and talk to us. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Linda. I'll show you some of my billions of years of experience. <laughs> you sound very old. <laughs> um, Almost as old as me. 25 years, just about, and since yeah. I first came to Alderhay in Liverpool and got interested in meningococcal diseases, yeah. so I'm going to talk about that. So, meningitis and septicemia. <coughs> I think we can. Uh, <coughs> really yeah. Don't fall asleep, I know it's the afternoon, you've had your lunch, it's <laughs> been a bit sunny outside. No. Okay. But <coughs> I try and split these things up. It's very difficult sometimes to explain the difference between meningitis and septicemia. Lots of people get the two confused and uh, try and explain what they are and why you might get different after effects from the two things. Okay. Meningitis, if you're a Greek and Latin scholar, which I'm sure lots of you did that at O level, haha, <laughs> means inflammation of this covering of the brain here. It's a covering of about three layers of things that's in fluid around the brain, which is there so if you shake your head around your brain doesn't get whacked on the side of the skull, it's got cushioning around that, so stuff in there to, to protect your brain, but you can get infection in there, and that's what meningitis is. Septicemia is what your granny would call blood poisoning, so that's infection within the bloodstream itself, so it can be in any part of the body, <coughs> whizzing all around in your bloodstream there. So here's the tricky slide. <coughs> going to a Venn diagram. <coughs> O-level maths. We're going to get O-level biology in a minute. So hold on to your seats. So meningitis can be caused by a number of different germs. In the UK, for uh, adults, pneumococcus is the commonest. For children, meningococcus is the commonest. We used to have HIV, but we've got a vaccine which is almost taken that completely away now. All your kids will get a HIV vaccine to prevent them getting that sort of meningitis. <coughs> These infections just infect around the covering of the brain. Now, when they first found this germ, the meningococcus, they called it a double blobby germ that causes meningitis. Meningococcus. Because they found it from the meningitis case. And it doesn't just cause meningitis, it can cause <coughs> septicemia at the same time. Um, and so, both septicemia and meningitis are in this thing called meningococcal disease. There's a big overlap here, but at this point we'll talk about the rest of the time, septicemia and meningitis. And we've been looking at that, so this is 31 years worth of information about children who've had that disease in Liverpool, that we've treated here at Alderhay over that period of time. And you can split them up into the various groups and say there are some who just had meningitis alone with meningococcus. Over that time, 185 of those, and very few of those children died, thankfully. So, Meningococcal meningitis, <coughs> so not many people die from it as well. <coughs> septicemia, right, see, about 250 children with that, you're much more likely to die from that. So it's the septicemia tends to be the killer part of the illness rather than the meningitis. Most children, however, with 620, actually have a bit of both. 
So it's hard to say, well, have they got meningitis or septicemia? Actually, they've got a bit of both. You tend to lean one way or the other, be more meningitis-like or more septicemia. But often they have a bit of both. So, so have they got meningitis or septicemia? Well, yes, they've got both. And that's where it gets a bit confusing, really, isn't it? So, on to the biology stuff then. Now, you might remember that um, <coughs> you have blood vessels which take your blood around the body. Yeah, blood vessels mm -hmm. are beautiful things, they, they've got space for the blood to go down, there's some red cells whizzing around. Uh, on the lining of the blood vessel here, you have a sort of non-stick surface. So it's like Teflon on the inside of your blood vessel, it makes it nice and smooth, so that um, you can uh, have the flow of blood going very nicely along there. So these red cells here, they go zooming around in your blood, they carry the oxygen, and take away carbon dioxide, remember all that, so you need oxygen and your tissues to go. Platelets, these bung up little holes and make your blood clot if you cut yourself. And these white cells here, they help to fight infection. So if you've got germs in your blood, then it might flow a bit quicker because your heart's pumping a bit faster. Uh, and then you have this trouble because you've got one of these germs, this meningococcus here, is actually in the bloodstream itself. So it's floating around in the blood, being trapped by a white cell. But these cells can throw out to toxins and some poisons out there, and then you get gobbled up by one of the cells in the white cells in your blood. That's good. Unfortunately, when they swallow it up, they, they're so excited about that, they send out lots <coughs> of chemicals, um, which then attract more white cells and cause some damage all around that. So some collateral damage from there. So when that's happened, what happens is that you strip this nice non-stick layer off the edge of the blood vessel and it's taken away. And so it gets zoomed off with the rest of the blood going around. So instead of having a lovely non-stick pan here, you've got a leaky sieve, which is a bit sticky. <coughs> if you take the blood out of, and put it in a test tube, and say, well, watch it clot, it doesn't clot very well because that non-sticky stuff that was up, what used to be on here is now inside the blood. So it makes your blood not clot very well. But inside, other things are happening. So because you've got holes, some of the blood could leak out of there. So the blood can leak out of the blood vessels. And so you see that in the skin, you see this rash that comes up, doesn't go away, but like blood seeping out under the surface of the skin. That's how that's happening. The fluid that's in the blood vessel can leak out too. It's a sieve rather than a pan anymore. So you've got fluid that leaks out, but so you're using lots of fluid from the blood vessels. You haven't got enough in there to keep it leaking out. And these platelets do the job they're supposed to do. They're supposed to plug up any holes, and so they start trying to plug up the holes there and think, well, we shouldn't have a hole there, and then they, they grab some of the red cells and stick them on there, and suddenly you're developing a bit of a clot on the side of your blood vessel there. And some of the chemicals in the blood, the clotting proteins come together and they help start making that, and it doesn't take long before you get this great big clump of clot that's sticking on the inside of your blood vessel, which means that the blood flows a bit slower and then you can finally bung up the whole blood vessel here, so you can't get any blood going to where it's supposed to go. And that means that wherever that space we're taking oxygen and things to, it doesn't get there. So the consequences of septicemia are that you have blood that if you take it out, it won't clot in the tube. The fluid leaks out, and so there's not enough blood going around, so you've got stuff leaking around, and the blood <coughs> doesn't get clots in them, so the blood doesn't get there. And that means there's not enough oxygen getting to the places you need them to get to, and so some of those tissues won't survive. So if that's fingers or toes or bits of skin, then that may start being damaged by that. Meningitis, then you have to put your blood vessel somewhere else. So here's the, that bit I was telling you about, that there's a fluid between the brain and the skull here, and your blood vessels run through here. Again, the same damage might occur when you're losing bits of the lining of the blood vessel, so stuff can leak out. But here, the germs themselves can leak out and get into the fluid around the brain. And there isn't any immune system normally in that bit of your body, and so they can grow quite quickly in there. Once the immune system realises that they're out there, it sends the troops in and they go in and attack them, cause all these chemicals to come out too, which drags in more of them. So you suddenly got getting lots of the cells to go and help start fighting that. So producing all these extra chemicals to fight that means that you get um, things that make your brain swell up a bit. Um, 
and also you've got the fluid leaking out of the blood vessels here. So the pressure here suddenly starts getting much more in your head. So you get a headache and all those symptoms from meningitis because there's extra pressure inside this <coughs> you know, all going on. So again, the consequences of that is that you can find these bacteria, germs, and the white cells in that fluid around the brain. That's what doctors look for when they do a test to look for meningitis. The first <coughs> bunch of tests is looking, can you find these things there? Fluid leaks out, and so your brain swells up. The blood flow is not as good as it should be, and again, you're not getting enough of the things your brain needs to actually work properly, and therefore there may be some consequences of damage from that point of view. So the after effects that you know probably about uh, are these sort of things. So meningitis tends to cause damage either to the brain or the hearing particularly is one of the things that gets damaged because of the infections around that area. Children who have septicemia, they tend to try and focus that the damage goes somewhere else and they tend to lose bits of skin or can lose fingers, toes, arms and legs sometimes because that's where the blood isn't getting to. Your body is smart enough to think if I haven't got enough blood to go around, I have to send it to the place that I really need it. So I send it to the kidneys, the heart, the brain, the vital bits. And the, the big scheme of things that if you're really unwell, then you don't really need it to go to my skin or my fingers perhaps. It's not thinking long term, just thinking I've got to do something now. And so it tends to be those areas that might be affected by it. Sometimes you can also get some learning problems too if you've got very severe septicemia. Skip that. Skip that. And get onto this and say, Meningitis Research Foundation are a wonderful group, even though they persuade me to do things that I want to do sometimes. <laughs> and one of the things they looked at was a group of children who had suffered amputations. Um, this is 10 years ago now, isn't it, when you start, started looking at these things. We started to have more children surviving after meningitis than meningococcal disease, which is great. Some of them were surviving losing fingers, toes, or other things. And so the question was, well, is that a good thing? Are we just producing children? We've got uh, more damage than it's worth having. And so the team from St. Mary's in London looked at nine children who they'd had on their intensive care unit who'd had some amputations of some kind to say, how are they getting on? This is a picture from the paper that they published about that. It shows you the sorts of amputations these children have had. So one person just lost a toe, but mostly it's, it's the legs that are lost and sometimes some fingers and things as well that go with that. They looked at how well these people were, uh, what their motor function is like, so how they could actually do things that you expect children of their age to do. Well, because they're losing bits of feet and things, they couldn't do exactly the same. But if you look at what they're actually doing compared to other children, were they swimming, cycling, painting? The answer is yes, they were. So they're doing all the things that other children were doing. When they looked at their quality of life, it was exactly the same as other children of their age. Apart from one child, this one down here, isn't it? You also had some learning difficulties. So if you didn't have learning difficulties, you managed to adapt and live a pretty normal life, even if you had these sort of amputations. If you had the learning difficulties as well, you didn't quite manage to adjust that way. So the conclusion was that that quality of life was genuinely good. This is one of the pictures from there. It's one of the ones that MRF uses. It's a lovely photo, isn't it? This little girl is painting, and she doesn't mind if she's painting without the tips of her fingers here, she's just having a good time, isn't she? Um, so that's good. So, the, the after effects. Um, the infection of the covering of the brain, meningitis, can lead to trouble with hearing or learning difficulties, whereas infection within the bloodstream can lead to things like skin loss and amputation, and occasionally to learning difficulties. Okay, there's five of us talking today, <coughs> so we'll never be as good as the tab four. So, we'll to do that. so I take, do you want to take questions now, Linda, or do you yeah, want to... Yeah, you've got five minutes or some <coughs> questions. So, and then so we've got a panel discussion later, haven't we? Yeah, we have so tea time, so. time for more questions after the after tea. Does anybody have any questions that would like to ask? That's my dad, granddaughter, um, either two years ago. Is there any chance she could catch it again? That would be, copy, that'd be very yeah. uncommon to do that. Once you've had it once, normally your, your body's immune system will recognise it and stop it happening again. A small number of people do get a second time, in which case they normally get a golden ticket to come to one of my clinics because there must be some problem with the way they fight infection and we want to check out why that is. So it would be very uncommon to get it more than once. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the, you said about the, the line and the, on the, the blood vessels. Yeah. Do after I mean, sort of like two or three years after the occasion, is, are they are they yeah, back to normal? Then? Quite quickly. Yes, but within probably a few days or, or weeks, certainly it's all back to where it should be. But by that stage, all of the things have happened about it. So mostly that's, that's all better. What is amazing repairing that, it just isn't quite quick enough to get on top of it when you really need yeah. it for that time when you're going, oh, well, isn't it? Yeah. And it repairs the lining all the time every day, which is great, but is it too much better. Is it often the case that if they do have amputations of some sort, or even severe amputations, that it just hasn't necessarily affected the brain as, as much? Yeah, you're quite right. It's amazing, isn't it? You think you're that unwell, you have that severe illness that you can lose fingers or toes. Many children have no trouble with learning difficulties with that too. So your body is somehow managing to keep everything else going, but it's just decided to lose those bits and pieces it thinks is just crucial all the time. So most children don't have any learning difficulties with it, which is amazing, isn't it? Um, and if that's the case, then people seem to adjust and do really well with that. Yeah. That right. seems like that affects more girls than boys. Is that the case in real figures, or is it...? Uh, I don't know. Either of you guys know? We looked at sort of five years, a decent five years' worth in all the hay, and I think males were the males and females definitely yeah. didn't have any real difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the trigger comes in a life bouts. You know, you'll have a couple of years where you're getting on and then all of a sudden you'll end up with five or six or a... A children who've got the disease or really bad disease that can cause amputation, I think. So. The amputation. The amputation. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly our experience was that we just got across that we had four children, didn't we, over a short period of time and we haven't seen any for some time before that or since. So we, certainly that's our experience. We've got a little cluster and then I haven't seen it for a while. I think other people see it, do you think? Same thing, it comes in, yeah. in runs. There's no predictability about it at all. I can't explain that. So whether something about a particular germ is more likely to do that than others, I don't know, but that seems to be what happened to her, actually. What about long-term prognosis? Is there any sort of impact on life expectancy? Following That's a bit about depends what sort of artifacts you have. So children who have severe learning difficulties and things we know their life expectancy tends to be shorter. Um, but if you've just got deafness or amputation, then that shouldn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have one question. I'll just jump in with it. And that is that, that some of the kids who have pure septicemia have some level of, usually not the really bad learning difficulties, but sometimes they have a bit of learning difficulty that does seem to arise from their illness, and yet they haven't had the meningitis. So how, how does that happen? Um, <coughs> well, if your circulation is not good enough to get enough oxygen around the whole body, then your brain could well be affected like those. If, if you're getting gummed up in one of the... Um, that's the price that's affecting a bit of your brain, and that's going to happen, isn't it? So it can be all over. It tries really hard to make the brain and the heart and the kidneys um, get everything it needs and to the detriment of everything else, isn't it? But sometimes it just, there isn't enough to go around, so you so can do it. That's good. It's like I skipped over, that's some more subtle problems with behaviour or learning that we can pick up later on. Docs are very good at measuring things they can measure, so testing someone's hearing, seeing if they've got fingers or toes missing, it's easy to measure, isn't it? So you can say that's what happens. The things that are more difficult, like changing behaviour or finding difficulty doing sums later on, people are only just starting to look at now, and we'll talk about I guess, a bit later on. Um, and there probably are those sort of issues that go on, which is very hard to measure and therefore give you an idea of how common that is, unless you really sit down and look at it very hard. Is it the set the same, yeah? Is that, is that um, I know it's a result of meningitis, is it sort of, is it a case you will get septicemia the longer it's left, or is it just, is it, it just one of those? It's the other way around, probably. So normally the germ gets into your blood first, <coughs> and that explains why septicemia is worse. If, if for some reason your body doesn't handle that germ in your blood very well, you get unwell very quickly, and you get the very bad septicemia. If you can somehow manage to contain it a bit in your blood, 
it's going for a while, and then it can end up giving you meningitis afterwards. Right. So it tends to be the septicemia first, and then the meningitis comes after that. And that's why you can have both. And the ones who do have meningitis somehow have managed to keep the, the germ a bit more under control, and therefore that's why they probably do a bit better. On that note, <laughs> thank you very much, Andrew. That was up. that was fantastic, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.
So if you wait, scars will really gradually get better over the course of 18 months to two years. They improve quite a lot. Now, the other things that influence scars, it's not just how the wound is healed up, but it's also influenced by other things. So it may be that you just happen to be somebody who doesn't make very good scars. And that can be just because of your genetic makeup. So some people just make worse scars than other people. If you've got Asian skin or African skin, you're more likely to make a lumpier scar than someone who's got white skin. <coughs> but sometimes people with white skin also make fairly bad scars. And some parts of the body are particularly bad. So this is a bad place. Your upper arms are bad places. Scars in those areas tend not to be so good. So what we're left with then is waiting really for scars to mature or settle down over time. But there are some things that we can do that would increase or speed up that settling down. And that's what Anna Nan will talk to you about in a minute or two. But the other thing to think about is that that scar tissue, um, as we've said, it's not the same as normal skin, but it's provided pretty good cover. So we, we ought to be glad we heal up, because if we didn't heal up, we'd get infections. So you've got this scar tissue now, but it's not going to be as stretchy as normal skin. It's not as robust as normal skin. It might not protect you against the sun in the same way as normal skin does. So as children grow, what we find is those scars don't tend to grow as much as, as, as you know, don't stretch properly uh, as a child grows up. So if the scar is overlying a joint, or if it's over an area, say, just at the front of your, your armpit or something like that, it won't stretch properly. So as children grow, you might find that their movement's a little bit impeded because the scar tissue is quite tight and they can't move their arms properly, they can't straighten their arm out. And they're called contractures. And that's because the scar itself can't stretch. And in those situations, sometimes we have to either take that scar away and make a new one, or we have to break the scar um, and, and deal with the wound that results in order to get movement. So if you had a scar over your arm like this and it was pulling tight so you weren't able to straighten your arm, we could take that scar out or we could break that scar and put a skin graft in there so you'd be able to, to get movement again. So that's one of the, the later interventions that we might need to do is to release scar contractures. The other things we find is because the scar, uh, as I've said, is quite thin, it's not the normal skin, so it's, it's quite fragile. So if you are now going to subject that uh, skin to repeated trauma, it's not as good as our own skin at recovering. So it's much more easy to break down, or I think somebody asked earlier on about blisters, you know, it's easy for that skin to get traumatised. And if it dries out, the, the scar doesn't have the same glands that ordinary skin has, it might get a bit drier, then it, it's more likely to break down with repeated trauma. And that's why we're often giving advice about using moisturising cream or keeping the scar moist. Yeah. Now the other thing we have to think about with scars is that you can never magic them away, which is a real shame and a great uh, source of, of research at, mo at the moment. And it, it was recently, in fact, researchers in Manchester thought they had found a, a compound which when you injected it at the time of surgery seemed to, to make scars virtually unnoticeable. Uh, but when they put it to phase three trials, it didn't work uh, in the, it, it, over hundreds of people. It worked just for a, a small proportion of people, and we didn't know which ones they were. So it, it's not being marketed, but it is an area of, of ongoing research. So all we can do with scars is we can keep them as good as possible, and we can look to change them into scars that are better scars than what we've already got. So later on down the line, we look at children's scars and we, we think, do we have to do anything functionally because they're very tight? But if it's a cosmetic problem, if it's because the, the way those scars look is not very good, then sometimes there are things that we can do to improve those scars. If they are long scars, it's sometimes possible to change the direction so that they, they're hidden a little bit better into skin creases. Uh, certain <coughs> scars in certain directions look a little bit better than scars, <coughs> scars in other directions. But sometimes if it's because they're very lumpy, or they're very tight, or they're, they've just got a horrible pattern on the top, sometimes we can take those scars out completely in surgery and 
resurface those scars using different methods, either by skin grafting or by using sort of artificial skins, which sometimes give a little bit of a nicer quality of skin. Now, I haven't gone into a great detail about those methods because everybody will, will be quite different, and it may be that you've got some sort of specific questions you want to ask around scars that we recommend to advance those rather than try to cover absolutely everything when it won't, won't apply to, to everybody. So, in summary, what I wanted to say about scarring is that the scar that you end up with depends on several <coughs> things. One will be how the wound healed. So if it healed together, edge to edge, the chances are it will make a better scar. If it's taken a long, long time to heal, which is often the case for children with meningitis, it's more likely to be a lumpy scar or an unsightly looking scar. We also know that if, if wounds take a very long time to heal, then the scarring is less likely to be as good. So if you can get a wound healed quickly, the scarring is likely to be better. We do know that over 18 months to two years, scars will definitely improve. Their colour gets better, they get softer, uh, and, and they definitely look much better. And there are some things we can do that will, will hasten it along. But we also know that scars don't stretch, and so when children grow, those scars <coughs> get tighter and may mean something during in the future. And we know that scar tissue is a bit more fragile, a bit more prone to sun damage, quite prone to drying out, and, and there's, that's why we have to have ongoing methods to, to make those scars better. So what I'd like to do is ask Anna and Anne if they'll just go through some of the non-surgical ways of managing scars. Now, you may already have, have used some of these things, and it may be that your children are beyond the time when some of these methods are helpful. But it's also useful to know that if you, your children do have surgery uh, in the future, either for cosmetic reasons or for functional reasons, quite often these methods are needed uh, at that time as well to try and make sure that those scars are as good as, as we can get. So you also just explain this to me. Hi, um, I'm Anne McGuire and I work in the scar management clinic. I'm just going to go over some basic care of scars first of all, some basic rules of how we take care of them and then I'll go over some different kinds of treatments that we use. There's lots and lots of different types of treatments and lots of different firms that produce the products but we'll go into that in a minute. Basically, um, scars will benefit, obviously, every day from washing the area and keeping it fresh. Um, we, have, we advise our parents to massage at least once a day. And the idea of this is, when Sean was talking earlier about the, the fibres being tangled, it's, this is to flatten it down. People will come and say, which product is the best? We don't really recommend any products. What we say is it's the actual action of the massage that breaks those, flattens those fibres down and breaks them down. What we'd advise is don't use anything that's too heavily perfumed. Um, keep it simple, like an aqueous cream or something that you know your child is not allergic to. Um, and then we'll go into uh, we'll go into the different types of treatments for uh, your scar. Um, the, we know that silicon helps scarring and there's lots of products with that in and they come in different forms. They can either be a spray, they can be an adhesive sheet, they can be tape, they can be gel. Um, and what we do with that is we'll look at where your child's scarring is, what its lifestyle is, and then we'll make the decision which is the best product for your child. We also use um, pressure garments and they're made to measure for your child and the, they're individual to them. Um, they'll probably use them for maybe the first year um, after the scars occurred. Um, and I think basically that's, what we'll do is we'll, in the break, during the break, we'll get all the products out. So at the end, you can come and try them and have a good look at them and ask any questions that you need to then. Um, just one more point. Um, we, um, uh, Sorry, we want you to um, protect the scars from the sun, that's very important, so we would advise you to use a, a 50 plus sunblock. And as Sean had said, that it's 18 months to two years before you know the end result of what the scar will look like. Um, <coughs> and uh, the reason 
uh, we ask you to use sunblock is that the scar can become pigmented and dark in colour um, and that can be permanent so that is quite important for the first two years of the scarring. Okay, thank you. That's about all I think. Any questions? Can I, can I just ask, you know the silicone product? Yes. Um, is that just like a lifelong thing to use? No. Or is it the 18 to 24? 18 months, yeah, yeah, to two years and then you can just use an ordinary moisturiser and yeah. really treat it the same as you would the rest of the skin on the child's body. Okay. What we tend to find with silicone is it will re for some reason we don't really know why. We don't know if it's the silicone itself that's affected or whether it's hydration from using the silicone over the scar to keep the, the scar moist. But it does seem to reduce the um, redness in the scar mm. and it does reduce the, the raisedness of the scar. Mm. So it is quite effective. And, and you, a scar looks sort of active when it's red and raised. Mm. But by the time it's softened and it's become white, paler and flatter, then silicone really won't be very effective. And it's the same with pressure garments. But people are using pressure garments all, all, all over the country. The evidence for pressure garments isn't, isn't great, but anecdotally, it does seem to work. So what it does show is that pressure garments do reduce the height of the scar, they reduce the height of the thick scars by quite a small amount, probably by about a millimeter, um, and when you're judging photos, it doesn't seem to make a, a, a big difference when people judge photos which had used which had used pressure garments and which hadn't. But I think if, if I say to any parent, you know, the chance that this will reduce your the height of your child's scar by a millimeter, it's I think everybody would would wish to go ahead to do what they can um, to make that scar as good as possible. But having said that, wearing a pressure garment is you know, it's quite a big ask for a child to do that. They're quite tight and wear them for. You know, for a year at a time, but certainly um, every clinician I've spoken to, although we all acknowledge that the evidence isn't fantastic, we've all seen children where, where the pressure garments being active, the scars are flatter, and where it's stopped, the scars are, uh, are, are, are more raised. So it, it does, you know, clinically it appears to be effective. Two questions. Yeah. The first one, um, rather than raised scars, we have got quite deep scars in the muscle, muscle which is something about the sort of things about which they yeah. Well, if there's any recommendations or ideas for what that can be done. It's, it's more about, I mean, we've been massaging yeah. it was for six years down the line, you know, yeah. but the fairly deep, dark ones, sort of, you know, sort of at the, at the back of the, the yeah. bottom, really, the top of the head. You can't actually get the fingers into massage them because it's still really painful. Yeah. <clears throat> and they are very dark, they're, they're as they were. The ones on your arms have, have, have done really well yeah. and they're very soft and everything's great. And then on the rest of the body, but it's just these sort of four or five on each button, really, that you, you cannot get in. And um, we're just wondering if you've got any recommendations that could possibly help with that. Yeah, and I think it, it's it's difficult to do something in a non-surgical way because the massage and moisturiser is the most is, is really the only thing right. that we've got in, in terms of for, for trying to soften the scars up. Sometimes what happens is you've lost tissue, and where I was saying about it trying to fill the wound in, sometimes it doesn't fill the wound in well, and you've just got that top layer and it's got stuck down to the muscle or something like that, and it, it le leaves you with little sort of indented, punched out marks. And if that happens, there's, there's two things really that, that you can do to, to well, three potential things you can do. One is to, if they're small areas, you can cut them out, and so edge to edge, so you actually just cut the, the divot out. So they're the sort of divots that we see when children have had orthopedic procedures and they've sometimes got pin sites where you sometimes get those little indented scars, you can cut those out quite effectively. So you swap your, your circular or your irregular scar for a, a linear scar. The other way you can do it is to, if it's too big to actually cut out, you can sometimes try and resurface it by using an art of taking with that top thin layer of not very good scar and resurfacing it <coughs> using an artificial skin with a skin graft on top. And sometimes you can inject fat underneath the, the scar to, to, to bolster it out. The thing with injecting fat is um, you've obviously got to have a place that you can take it from. And lots of children are, are quite skinny. They're, you know, they're not like us, or we're all quite happy to have a bit of liposuction. But you take it usually from the tummy or the legs, and you can infiltrate it under the scar. If it's really stuck down to the muscle, it doesn't infiltrate very well. Sometimes it's better to resurface it first and infiltrate it after. The other thing you can do in a non-surgical way is you can use prosthetic fi uh, fillers. So, you know, as we saw the, the, the prosthetic limbs and the limb covers, you, you can have um, 
you can have those custom made with special adhesive to fill those indented areas and that works very well as well. <coughs> the other question was a much like that question, but the scarring from a skin graft side, should that be treated any differently to the scarring from the release? No. 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 Well, all, it's the same process really for however you've got <coughs> the, the, the scar is really just the, the end result of the body is trying to heal up. And if you've got a skin graft there, what you've done is you've actually um, just done quickly what the body would have been trying to do for itself. So the body will eventually be trying to send little cells across until it finally healed over. And the skin graft <coughs> is just a very thin layer of your own cells plonked on as one layer, so it's done it much quick, quicker. So in some ways, putting the skin graft on is good because it will get the wound healed much quicker. And wounds that don't take so long to heal tend to make better scars. So if you'd left it, probably it would have healed in, but it might have taken months and months and months. <coughs> so a skin graft scar really is, is the same. The only other thing to say is that when you're doing skin grafts in an acute situation, quite often we mesh the graft, which means we make it look a bit like a net, mm -hmm. so you get this sort of stippled pattern. Whereas when you do it uh, in, a, in a less acute situation, you can put a skin graft down with no mesh pattern, mm -hmm. and that actually cosmetically looks a bit better. Is it uh, usual for, you know, this, I mean, obviously the skin goes really soft when you when the disease is still uh, in process through your body. It's nice when he ended up with, you know, where the tube went up his nose, it yes. ended up eroding his nose, and yes. the, get, uh, the mask on his face eroded his lips, yeah. and even the sticky tape on his face yeah. left scar. Yeah. Is, is that sort of quite a usual? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's not, I, I don't know about usual, but it's not uncommon. So because children are so sick, they they have to have those tubes. Yeah. And it is quite common for those tubes to to, to rub a little bit in the car. I mean, obviously stage. now he's left with more surgery, yeah. which he won't have at the moment yeah. because he's terrified of surgery, but it's just more surgery in the food, you know, on his lips and, and his nose. Yeah. And I mean, I think the thing is, we, we've really gone through the sort of non-surgical options. Mm. Um, you know, there are things that we can do cosmetically to make yeah. those notches look better, but they do involve... Surgery. So, yeah. just to give you an example, and I can't, I can't won't be talking to you because I know we're short on time. But you know, you can take a little bit. You can take a little bit from your from your ear. That's I just think the right the size. The idea is is to take his you know. scalp, bring that down. You can do. There's lots of yeah, you know, there's loads quite of options. A bit. But the the thing to remember is that we're doing it for cosmetic reasons, yeah. and so it's a, it's around making sure that you know the, the child is is happy mm. to have it done, appreciates what can be achieved, what's realistic, you know, acknowledges that that's the way they are, they don't have to have anything done. So it's a big, you, you know, it, all, all these things for scar management, they're best done as a team, you know, like we all work together, got the physiotherapists, any scar management we do is in association with the physios and with the psychology team to make sure that, that children appreciate you know, what they're putting themselves through and what the end result is likely to be. Mm. I think I'm going to have to stop our, our bit of session, but we'll be here at break. And, um, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
But I would have thought, you know, in general, it's good to have a liner because you're, you've got that added protection between the, the prosthesis and the skin. And it's the same way, if you've got any little area that's starting to look red, or, or that's the first sign of skin damage, is redness that doesn't really go away. So obviously if you'll sit across legs, you'll, you'll get a red area that will then, then get back to normal. But once you start getting pressure damage, you get a red area and that redness doesn't really go down. So when you see that, that's good to then put a little bit of padding over that. And that can be just a, a, a foam dressing or a, just a bit of a padded dressing. That could be quite helpful if your prosthesis goes on. And then your liner might be one way of achieving that. We tend to find with liners with a lot of the silicone base, so that you can give the scar so it's got our Left leg in particular is grafted all the way up to his hip. So he would wear his liner as high up his leg as he could when it was healed to just soften the skin after we cleaned it. And it creates an artificial environment so he gets the age of very, very good. But it really softens his skin. It's on the creates a bit of pressure as well we found um, when uh, our son had um, pressure garments on his legs but um, obviously when he had his prosthetic legs on it created another thickness layer so it w the, the legs weren't fitting in with them but they said when he's got his liner on and his leg on that creates enough pressure to compact the scars anyway um, so he didn't have to wear his pressure garments apart from when he was in bed at night when he didn't have his legs on so this is uh, Dr. Mr. I get mixed up with surgeons, but Mr. Fergal <laughs> who has loads of experience in working with, with children who have had lingococcus epsemia, and is going to give a great talk about um, other bone complications. Thanks very much. Um, I always feel a real fraud addressing people like you, because I see a lot of youngsters with the consequences of meningococcal disease. And they are so tough that I'm kind of standing here and talking about them. It always seems like I'm cheating in some way. I can't be you. And if it doesn't, if, it, if, I, if, I, if you use the wrong language, it's not because I don't care, it's because I don't know. And what I see, I see this patient group from, from a clinical perspective, which is what I have to do. That's what I'm asked to do. And what I want to try and show you is some of the things that we've worked out to try and assist some of the youngsters that I'm asked to, to, to deal with. And it's really, it's no more than that's all I can do. Um, I work in Bristol, which is there, and our catchment is the South West, which is about 15, something about 5 million people. And so we, we've got quite a lot of people, so that generates in a year, not a lot, but a, a reasonable number of patients who have meningococcal disease. Because of the geography, they all come to us. And so, by accident in many ways, I've got the experience of looking after them just because I was standing in front of them. There's nothing more to it than that from my point of view. And what I'd like to try and do is to share some of the things we've learned. That's where I work. It's kind of a nice place to be. <coughs> what became very obvious several years ago is that patients were coming quite a long way, someone from Cornwall to come up and see us, and then the next week they'd come up to see the plastic surgeon and then the next week they come up to see the prosthetics people and so what we did is we put together a clinic where everyone comes just once and we do this about four times a year and we try and get as many of the relevant people in the same room at the same time. This is Ted who says hello. All the people who are on the slides say hello and um, he's a bit of a legend. He's there controlling the clinic um, and it, there's plastic surgeons, physiotherapists, orthotists, uh, burns physiotherapists, all the people who are necessary to be there. Um, we looked at the number of patients in our area and in the last 10 or 12 years there's been 292 patients with meningococcal septicemia through the intensive care unit at the Children's Hospital in Bristol. Unfortunately about a 10% mortality rate, but what was interesting if that's the right word, it probably isn't the right word, again that's the clinical thing coming through, is about 10%, one in 10 of these children will require some form of orthopaedic opinion, not necessarily a procedure, but a, a pair of orthopaedic trained eyes to look over the problems that they may or may not be developing. And really from my point of view, it, it chunks up into either complete recovery, which is about nine out of 10. They don't need to see me, and this, this is the obviously the outcome that we all want to happen. But for the other nine out of 10, 
there's either recovery, but with damage to the growing bones, it sometimes doesn't become obvious for some time afterwards. There's also the issue of limb loss, which was discussed earlier, and a significant number will have some degree of limb loss, and that varies from just fingertip loss to complete loss of limb. Now, I thought about the content of the talk. There are one or two slides which may be a, a inappropriate. They're, they're, they're of <coughs> missing limbs. And I apologise, but I find, it, I find it difficult to talk to you about the subject without, without visualising it in that way. So I, I, I have thought about it. I'm not going to chuck it. It's a very oh, surgical and particularly orthopaedic thing to do is to chuck the gorious slides of your worst operations and think you're pretty clever about it. But that's not what I want to do at all. So if you just run with me, I think you, you, the message I hope will be clear at the end. Then there's the issue of limb loss with growth arrest when you get both of these complications. And that's probably one of the most difficult groups that I'm asked to advise on. So if we call it recovery with growth arrest, this is, I'm used to watch, looking at these, but that's an x-ray of someone standing up. The area I want you to look at is the knee on the left side, that's the white box. And if you get an MRI scan of that, you'll see, I don't have a pointer, but it's that, that line there <coughs> is called a growth plate. And that's where the bone grows longer from. And part of the deal with meningococcal septicemia and the blood flow changes that goes with it is that often that, which is a very sensitive area, becomes damaged. And if it becomes damaged such as there, it won't grow. And that means the limb will be either shorter or shorter and crooked or both. And so that's what causes it, as I understand it. And it's not an uncommon complication. And so just this just shows it that that leg is clearly shorter and it's clearly malaligned. And one of the other problems is because of the skin loss that accompanies this condition, it's difficult to do sort of operations that involve big scars, plates, etc. And so what we've developed, this is techniques we use in a number of other environments, but this allows us to do a number of things with a limb. It allows us to straighten it and it allows us to make it longer in the context of very often very, very dense scar. And it allows us to make is a that that there is about a sort of a four centimeter elongation of the leg. This is the same patient as you saw earlier on. And that's all very clever and we kind of we make careers out of doing things like this, but there is a person who has to wear the thing. This is Tyler. And he was a miserable young man <laughs> because he was having this done to him. And his father is a very, very wise guy. And he asked me one day how much the equipment cost. And I told him. And the next thing he did is he went out and bought shares in the company. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Tyler's share certificate. And afterwards, he's a very, he's a really, he's another team, he's a really tough little man. Well, he's a big guy, and I'll show you in a minute. But he, after that, he said, look, you can do as much as this as you like, because I'm making money. <laughs> <laughs> and so he made his leg longer and straighter. And again, that's just a line going through the centre of the joints. And that's him now. I'm afraid it's cut off. That's not on purpose, because he's, he's very happy to, to you know, stand. Now, he's still got a slight... It, I, I think he's got a malalignment of his right leg. He doesn't. He's not too worried about it. He's going to come back and want to do it. But that is, you know... We straightened and lengthened his legs. He's, he's a very functional fellow. He's playing sport. He's, he's, he's thinking about college, and he'll come back if he wants that doing. So that's yeah, that's some things we can do. If the limb is lost, as unfortunately is a not uncommon outcome, there are still a number of things from a, an orthopaedic perspective that are possible. This is a lost limb. This is the growth plate. Again, this is growing. This one isn't growing, so that won't grow longer. If it's growing only in one bit and not the other bit, it will also grow out of line. Now, because most of the children have the severe illness in the first couple of years of life, this doesn't get longer, and that's not going to be long enough to, to work an artificial limb as an adult. And so there are quite real issues about what can we do or potentially do to improve that. And again, it's in the context of very, very scarred and damaged soft tissues. And so that's just growth plate open, growth plate closed. And so the issues with the lost limb are length, and the residual length of the limb is very important, because if it's very short, it's actually not functional, and it's probably in the way. Uh, my, my colleagues in prosthetics say a very short 
the lower knee segment is probably not any advantage at all. But obviously a knee that works is a massive advantage because it can make a, a, a prosthetic wear and use much more efficient. If the limb grows out of line, it's the same as having your own leg, it's out of line, you can't walk on it. And so both of these issues need to be addressed. This is a, an example, and um, this is a completely lost limb. Now the problem here is there's not enough residual limb to allow a prosthetic of any sort without a strap over the shoulders and a waistband. And this little man, I only wish at the moment, he's seven years old, I'm allowed to talk, I've asked Alex, I've asked him and he's very comfortable with me discussing with you. His dream is to be able to wear his leg without the straps. And on that basis, we thought we'd do some surgery. And that's made that longer. We've done it a couple of times, and we've made his, his residual limb long enough so that now he can, at the age of seven or eight, he can wear a prosthesis without a strap. He's pretty pleased, but he, he really had to work hard for this. We may have to do it again in future. The reason I want to show you Alex is because he's a really thoughtful young man. And the way we describe our lengthening procedures is in number of centimetres per unit time per month. But that wasn't good enough for Alex because he thought about it himself. And he actually came up with this himself. And I'm going to write a paper with him about this. And we now in Bristol talk about lengthening of residual limb in terms of Smurf's head. Because <laughs> this is what he brought this to me. And I'm, I'm giving you this on his behalf because this is my work. He said, this is where we started, and he's a very smart young man. 0.42 Smurfs heads. <laughs> and this is where we are now, it is 1.12 Smurfs heads. And he's even, he said, and the, and he said, and the conversion fact, that is that. <laughs> and so that's from Alex, and I thought that was fantastic. I mean, he, he, he's in a position now, we were able to increase the length of that residual part of his leg, and at the moment, he's satisfied, he will grow. He's seven years old now, he will be a man, that will not be long enough. We have to then decide whether it is legitimate to do it again, and that's a discussion I'll have with Alex in due course. Again, the scarring, I don't, this is the slide I was thinking about, the scarring here, this really does make it very difficult to do conventional surgical procedures. It won't heal, the risk of infection is high, and one thing after the journey this child has been through, the last thing you want to do is something that turns out very badly, that they actually lose more tissue, that they end up worse off than if they'd started, if, if, if they'd never come to see you. So this is, it's, this is why we developed the, 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 the techniques of actually doing the surgery with the fixators, provided there are very clear functional goals. We're not just doing this because we can. Each case that we've treated has a specific functional goal. This young lady's limb was not long enough. She could not use a prosthesis usefully. And she's a very active young lady, or she's a child here, but she was struggling to use a prosthesis. Her prosthetics people said, we need more length, can you do that? And so that ring there moves to there. These are the same, that moves down. And it's a technique we use for limb lengthening in other circumstances. All the soft tissues, the scarring, the scarred muscles, the blood vessels, the nerves and the bone will lengthen provided you do it slowly enough. And you're able to make this longer to a useful degree. And we got the gadget people to stick the foot on and while she was in treatment, if she put her dress down, you wouldn't know she was having a... She used to run around the clinic. Now, that's... This is Levana now and this is... She's a very high class swimmer. And what she wanted to be able to do was two things. She wanted to be able to walk in a, you know, in a, in a normal way. She wanted to continue with her swimming. And she only re she required one operation. That was the one operation. It, was obviously, it took several months out of her school time. But I'd just like to show you, starting from a very difficult situation, which was a very short leg, which was insufficient for a prosthesis at the age of seven or eight there, to where she is just now. I hope it runs, because that's her just now. Now she's got both legs lost below the knee, and she now uses um, a very efficient prosthesis. And we were quite pleased with that. Then she came back to clinic, and she was so cross. 
because she's a really good swimmer and she's, she's looking at doing Paralympic trials, etc. And it's now impossible to grade her because we've made her leg longer and she's now out of the class <laughs> that she started in. And so it's the, it's the law of unintended consequences. We then had to write all these letters to the, to the swimming people saying, you yeah, know, for goodness sake, just, you know, just... <laughs> Just for God's sake, just <laughs> shut up! <laughs> but that was in kind of articulate prose. <laughs> it was so stupid. But I suppose the reason I wanted to put it is because yeah, when we started, this is some years ago. It was, it was I think, experimental is the wrong word because it was techniques that we were very comfortable with in other circumstances, just being used in a different context. And this is really it's, in 15 minutes. It's very difficult to, to to talk through all of the things that we've been up to over the last several years, but that's just a flavour of what we think we can offer to some, and they're very selected individuals with very specific uh, 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 asks of us. I'd be very happy to try and answer any questions if you've got them, um, but there is a panel discussion later which I hope we'll be able to take part in. Thank you very much. <coughs> Is there any optimum age to when you would do those sort of procedures, or is it? Uh, yeah. My son's four. I think you've already seen some of the, the, the sort of um, some of his X-rays from the Impala Stone in Swansea. Um, you look at that. Yes. <laughs> Come on. <yeah. laughs> um, and I just some of the questions I have is whether how soon we actually do the operations we're talking about with his left leg. It's a great question. I'm not going to dodge it. There are. The, there is an optimum age, but we can't always service that. So yeah. I wouldn't want to be doing this type of reconstruction on someone under six or so years old. In general terms, a four, trying to explain to a four-year-old, even a very, very bright four-year-old, what you're doing mm -hmm. is just a nonsense. Trying to explain to a seven-year-old is a completely different deal. And I think that people become able to engage I'm not a child psychologist, I'm an orthopaedic surgeon, I'm way off territory here, but, <laughs> but um, it's, it's, I can talk in a way I think, we can have a conversation and we can do a deal. The parents of transport, because this is someone I'm going to be getting to know for a long, long time, and at seven or so is when I'm comfortable thinking about it. There are some kids who can't wait that long because they're losing function, there are specific reasons and you have to do it earlier. But if I can possibly wait until mid-childhood, and then it's the whole deal with how's it gonna affect school, how's it gonna affect life, you know, you, you plan it around the other things that are happening. So, if possible, not before six or seven. But if necessary, when it presents. And with the lengthening of the bone, is there any risk of bone density? Not bone density, uh, we don't know. Um, using the models from lengthening in other contexts, the bone density goes down, for about a year and a half, and then provided you're walking and putting load through it, then it goes up again. <coughs> the problem in lengthening people who've lost limbs is the soft tissue cover. And the, the, I, well, that's why I work in very close collaboration with my plastic surgical colleagues, because you can link, it sounds crass, you can link the bone, is, the, the surviving bone is generally healthy bone, and it will behave in a predictable way in that if you pull it, it will lengthen but the soft tissues which are scarred and very significantly damaged may not. And you can get into a situation where you're too ambitious and you end up with the bone is actually not covered by anything useful, which is not useful as, a, as an end of limb. So it's a big, we've, we've, we've actually added bits of tissue. There's a, one of our plastic surgeons that's <coughs> adding three flaps to the end of um, the limb, which you know, we've got four, four cases um, that we've had good results with but they're only short to only two or three years follow-up. We don't know what's going to happen long term. So in answer to your question, bone density doesn't seem to be a problem, but there are a whole heap of other problems which we have to overcome when we do this type of work. This is not easy. Uh, yeah, surgically, it's not easy. And for the person having it done, it is very, very hard. Um, in response to the, um, uh, the, the problems with the platelets, uh, the, the plates in the bone, yeah. um, would they have diagnosed that at the beginning, or is it something that you may come across later? Or? That's, a, that's a great question. It's almost historic. Previously, it was almost always recognised later because we didn't understand that that was something that happened. Yeah. What I try and do now is I try and make you know, 
big noise about to my colleagues who are looking after youngsters who have had meningococcal septicemia, look out for growth plates, measure leg lengths. The other thing, look out for, make sure that the arms rotate because the forearms can be affected as well as, the arms can be affected as well as the legs. So what I try and do is now I actively look for it. About one in 10 youngsters will have some form of growth arrest. <coughs> Whether it's important or not, depends on how much. Sometimes it's just a tiny bit of difference in leg length, which doesn't matter. Yeah. And sometimes it's a very, very significant difference in length and shape of bone. Sometimes it's three or four years later. Right. If, if it's very bad, yes. you'll notice early. Mm. If it's subtle, you'll notice later. Who would be keeping an eye on that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if there was like certain professions that we go and um, see every time that do look for it, but we're just not aware that they are looking for it. Or I think that the medical profession in general is becoming aware of it and is starting to look at it, whereas previously wasn't aware of it. So I think hopefully, you know, Everyone shouts about looking at growth plates, and people will look more closely. Google, from sort of the MRI scans you've shown, then would you be able to notice if there's growth plate? If it's bad, yes. yes right, right. Sometimes the growth plate looks good or unaffected on an MRI scan, but it's not normal. What happens then is it's slowed down, and an MRI scan can show a reasonably normal looking growth plate, but it just doesn't grow as quickly. What I look for more often is what's happened to that child during their illness, and there are certain key signs, particularly the, the, the the, the, the amount of soft tissue damage in certain key sites, and the, you know, the nose, ear lobes get affected, but the fronts of the knees get affected. And if you've got very obvious scarring or in, sort of black scarring over that, then I'm very, very worried about growth rest. Also, the lower part of the, the ankle tends to be affected as well, and the inside of the ankle, not the outside. So there's certain patterns I look for in the skin changes at the time of the initial illness. That's helpful, but nothing will. I think it's by surveillance, that's the most important thing. Well, if there aren't any more questions, we should, we should maybe have a break now. And I hope probably you're, you're saying oh, that yes. oh, and, yes. and you can approach people during the break, which I think is just next door. In yeah. So um, we can be in about, it's, we're, we're running uh, about 15 minutes late. So, um, I'll run this piece so quickly for a break. So we have two more presentations for you this afternoon and then there'll be a panel discussion and you'll have a chance to ask anything you didn't get a chance to ask before. So our first speaker is Natalie Coleman, clinical psychologist at Alphabet, and she's going to talk to you for about 15 minutes about the psychological impact and um, there'll be time to ask more questions during the panel discussion as well. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yes, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the psychological impact of the managed concept scene. Um, I could probably talk for a long time about all the different things because they're so specific to the age of the child, to the family, to the experience of the illness. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is just do a very quick sort of overview of some of the um, psychological effects that you may have experienced already or that you may come across, um, but then focusing particularly on um, probably two of the areas that I get referrals for the most. Um, so, so um, we know that kind of for any child being admitted to hospital with kind of an, an acute illness, um, there, there can be a psychological impact on the child, on the whole family, um, on the siblings. Um, and we know that the nature of the chronic illness will have some role, or the acute illness will have some role to play in of what emotional symptoms we might see. Um, thinking about the meningitis patients that, that we've seen here at Older Hay, um, we know that there can be emotional and behavioural difficulties following an illness. Um, and in particular, sort of traumatic stress symptoms, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a moment. Um, adjustments to sort of changes in function, changes in appearance. We've heard lots today about limb loss and about scarring, and again, I'm going to talk about some of that adjustment in a bit more detail. Um, <coughs> we have mentioned kind of possible cognitive impacts in so any learning difficulties, um, kind of impacts on hearing or on sight. Um, managing sort of acute yeah. hospital treatment, ongoing treatment. Again, we've heard lots about for lots of children, this isn't kind of they leave hospital and that's the end of their journey, they go on to have further procedures further down the line, further operations as they grow. 
And as I said, you know that this can have an impact on the whole family. So our department here in the hospital offers support to anybody within the family who may be affected. Um, the impact in terms of um, the psychological impact can um, be influenced by things like the age and developmental stage of the child. So not only the age that they are when they um, are in hospital and they're unwell, but also <coughs> kind of further down the line in the developmental stage than that. So we know that there are particular ages where children may struggle more with some issues. So for example, I'm thinking about adolescents and appearance related concerns. The severity of illness and admission to intensive care can have an impact. We know that families who are admitted to the intensive care unit, there's a higher proportion of families who will experience things like traumatic stress symptoms. Um, and the experience of hospital treatment, pain, length of admission, and all of that has an impact as well. Um, so when we kind of think about recovery, um, I guess we're thinking about not only the physical recovery for patients, but also the emotional recovery. And that can often be something that in the kind of acute stages, there's a lot of focus on that physical recovery and getting well and getting out of hospital. But and it can be further down the line and the emotional impact can hit the wants to kind of the physical and acute side as well. <coughs> so just gonna talk a little bit about traumatic stress symptoms. This is it's not an exhaustive list, but this is some of the common of reactions that, that children or adults can have um, to a frightening event such as an acute hospital condition. Um, you might read through <coughs> those and recognise some of them from when you were in hospital or they might be things that have continued. Um, common ones that, that we sort of notice early on are things like disturbed sleep or nightmares or children being more clingy or not wanting to be left alone. <coughs> These are all really normal reactions to something that happens happen to you this point. Um, and what we tend to see is that over kind of a period of time, these lessen and resolve by themselves. Um, occasionally, if they persist or they seem to worsen, say after a couple of months, that might be when um, psychological support is helpful. Um, I won't read through all of them. I think you've got these in your handouts as well. So as I said, for all ages, it's, it's, it's really normal to experience these symptoms, even for quite a while after a frightening event. Um, we know that parents and siblings can experience these symptoms too, even if they didn't kind of witness, um, I guess, the acute admissions of intensive care, but just knowing um, that somebody that you care about has been through something so serious can be enough to, to cause those symptoms for you. And these symptoms can occur at any point after a traumatic event. So, you might find that actually you or your child is fine for a long time, but then something may trigger <coughs> those off or trigger a reminder um, further down the line. Um, we know that children worry less and recover from these symptoms quicker if people around them um, help them to see that those reactions are normal. Um, I think often families that we talk to will say, I, I thought I was going mad, I was feeling all these things, and actually just having someone say these are really normal reactions and you're not going mad other people feel this too and they will get better. But sometimes all that we need to do particularly is to change. Um, and yeah, as I say, with kind of healthy support from those around them, most children recover from those kind of symptoms very quickly. Things that help. And again, some of you may feel that you're a long time down the road, I don't know what stages everybody is at, so these things might be more helpful for some of you than others. Um, Helping children to feel safe, so giving them lots of reassurance, um, keeping to routines, um, helping them to know what to expect. Children kind of, they're really good with routines, you'll notice that at home, just having bedtime routines and the way that you um, manage kind of just a normal day at home with your children, they respond well to routines, and it helps them to predict what happens and it helps them to feel safe. That can be hard in hospitals to mm. stick to those. Um, but we often try and talk to families about trying to keep some of those routines mm. as many as they can. Um, giving children um, just simple statements around what's happened to them. So, like I say, lots of reassurance. Yes, you're safe now, you were hurt, but um, you're getting better now. Sometimes if children are experiencing any of those traumatic stress symptoms, um, they can feel like they're back there when it's happening. 
happen again. And just that reassurance is what can help. And making sure that parents and family members understand what's happening and what's going on. And that's really key because actually if, if, if all of you don't, don't have an explanation for what's going on or aren't able to understand things, it's much more difficult for you support your children. So again, often as psychologists we have a role in helping families to navigate all of the medical information and the different people involved and making sure that they have a sense of what's going on. Um, so helping children, what happened? So, Children do need explanations of what has happened to them. Often, um, I'm sure you've all experienced where you're not fully aware of, of, of something that's happened, you fill in those gaps, you make up those stories for yourself, and sometimes you can imagine things that are far worse than they actually were. Um, we know that even really young children can benefit from having explanations, um, and obviously those are age appropriate, so a young child might not need to know much more than you're very poor and then you're very the doctors looking after in the hospital. <coughs> as they grow, that will change and they may have questions as they get older or ask you different things um, and may need a bit more information. Um, helping children to make sense of what's happened to them. Um, it can also correct misunderstanding. So again, if, if children um, have misremembered something or they've just put pieces together that don't go together and then come up with a different story. Um, and what all of this does is it also helps prepare children for answering other people's questions further down the line. Um, so letting children talk when they're ready to. Um, so some children might not want to talk about what's happened to them. Obviously some of them might be too young at the moment but they may want to talk about it further down the line. Um, being able to be ready to listen if the child wants to talk, um, being able to I guess you don't even need to be saying anything back, it's just acknowledging that you're listening and that they've been heard. Um, we know that often it, there can be a temptation to sort of not talk about anything because we don't want to upset people, we don't want to upset the child. Um, that can, children are very good at picking up on that and they can very quickly learn that this is something they want to talk about. So kind of being able to be open about it will help them and being they can approach you with those questions. Um, Talking needs to be done sensitively and when the child's ready. So we're going to take cues from them. So it's not right at five o'clock tomorrow we're going to sit down and talk about what happened. It's as and when they're asking those questions and seeming to want to talk, taking their lead really. Um, and some children might, you might find that they are drawing pictures about being in the hospital or they're playing and they're reenacting things. And you can use those as opportunities to engage them in, in talking and providing them understanding of how So, but that's kind of a very brief whistle stop tour of kind of traumatic stress symptoms. Again, I'm around later. If anybody feels that they recognise any of that and they want to ask them any more about that, then do come back to me. The other thing that I was asked um, just to mention was, was thinking about an adjustment to change the <coughs> um, And this is something I work um, quite a lot in the Bairns unit and work with, with children who have their injuries and have scarring. And, and this is a lot of the work that I end up doing, particularly as children get older. Um, <coughs> again, the age and development of stage of the child affects kind of how they adjust to a changed appearance. So we know from literature that children who um, receive a scar or a, or a change to their before the age of two um, aren't very likely to remember you know, what they looked like before that. They haven't really formed their body image yet. Children who are more school age will um, will notice that change and they might almost kind of grieve for that change in their appearance. We know that adolescence is a really key time um, for concerns about appearance for, for, for children generally um, and there's often um, a lot of adolescents have seen centres around body image and appearance and we can get referrals for um, children who might have been received a scar when they were very young and have managed very well but actually they get to adolescence and that just goes a bit more of a struggle. Um, kind of how, how you adjust to an altered appearance can also depend on um, how you felt about your appearance beforehand. So for people who appearance was very important part of, of their self-identity and their image may find that adjustment really difficult. 
We also families will talk about things like scarring being a permanent reminder of um, how they got their scars, so of meningitis or of that time in hospital. And again, people, that isn't necessarily in a negative way, so we get a whole range of um, experiences where people will talk very positively about this shows I survived and kind of have very positive messages about their scars. But then also people for whom it almost triggers some of that traumatic response as well. And um, we've heard people talk earlier today about how important things around expectations for future recovery, treatment, healing, what can be achieved with surgery and all of that. That has an impact as well on how people adjust to change to things. Um, so that was just to demonstrate that, that as I was saying, there's changes depending on the age and different concerns arise at different ages in terms of things. Um, so in terms of things that help, how do you help children, um, I guess, carry on regardless of their concerns about changing appearance? We know that being able to build self-esteem, um, sort of self-confidence and <coughs> social competence are really important. So often young people will talk about it. It's kind of the social setting, the so social settings and the social situations where they might be more conscious of their appearance. And helping young people to be confident and take control in social situations um, can boost their self-esteem and their self-confidence. Um, in terms of building self-esteem, these are probably all things that you do naturally as a parent anyway. Um, <coughs> noticing your child when they do well and giving them specific praise. Um, helping your child to notice and remember the good things that people say about them. I think we often have a tendency to focus on, on the negative and remember the one criticism or, or the difficult situation that happened. So helping to have a narrative around all of the positive things that happen can be helpful. Sort of making time to sit down and talk to your child, encouraging them to discuss their ideas and feelings. Again, this is more for children as they get older. Probably when you get to around the age of seven, as we kind of before as being an age where children are much more able to have that kind of conversation. Encouraging a child to do something they're particularly good at, helping them celebrate their achievements, increasing body confidence, for example, through sports. So we heard a lot about that this morning from some of our speakers. Um, and again, we know that often for young people who have been changed their appearance or scarring, they're concerned about helping children to um, gain a positive view of their body in terms of its physical capabilities can be really Peer support and meeting others in a similar situations. So I guess that's what you're all here doing today. Um, skip through that. So again, just helping, um, particularly in terms of social contacts, giving your child opportunities to be around friends, promoting yeah. friendships, promoting those positive experiences of when with people who are supportive and, and helpful. Um, this is something, and again, I've put a website on the back the handout which is changing things. So this is something that people talk to me a lot about, which is managing other people's reactions. Um, I guess both the parents themselves, but then also how do you help equip your child for those situations in the future. Um, one of the key things is around helping children to have to have a story, as I said before, an age appropriate story that helps them to have an understanding about what's happened to them, but also means that if they're in a position where somebody says what happened to you, they've got an answer, maybe pre-prepared, and you can practice at home. It doesn't need to, I think people often um, will talk to me about, I guess, feeling a need to go into loads of detail and how much do you say and how much do you give. And actually, the majority of the time, if you're happy with the sentence, you don't need to go into loads of detail. So just saying, I was very poor when I was in hospital, but I'm okay now, can be enough for lots of people. Um, I'll just jump further down and kind of explain reassure yeah. distract technique. It's something that Changing Lives has talked a lot about. They've got loads of resources on their website. Really nice little books that you can order for free from them. Um, handouts you can download. Tools for schools about talking about difference and promoting an awareness and understanding of difference. Um, and this technique is, is one of the ones that they promote. So helping people to have, um, like say, almost like a ready-made sentence. So when you give very brief explanation, you give statements of reassurance. Because often people worry that 
the child's in pain or, or there's something else going on to be able to say um, the reassuring statements and then being able to move the conversation on to something else. Um, and they talk about how important that is in terms of helping children to take control of the situation um, and feel confident in it. So it is a really helpful website. They deal with kind of physical things across the spectrum. So there's all sorts of conditions and things referred to, but the handouts are relevant, I think, for, for everybody. Um, yeah, so those are just some tips, really. I think just having a having story and a narrative. And that will change, as I said, as they get older. And finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, resilience and positive adjustments. And again, we've heard about this today as well. So I guess talking about the psychological impact, sometimes it's a temptation to get, get drawn into talking about all the negative psychological impacts. But we know that for some people, um, they come out of, of a very acute illness or hospital admission with actually very positive adjustment further down the line. And I know several of our speakers this morning have talked about it being an opportunity to, well, it opened up other opportunities, it opened up um, a chance to kind of live in their own life, um, the increased empathy for others and tolerance of difference. So I just wanted to end on a bit of a positive note um, that actually um, it can be a rocky road, it can be a positive adjustment as well. And I feel like I've talked at breakneck speed and whizzed through loads of stuff, so <laughs> I don't know if anyone's got any specific questions. I guess I have just one question, and that is in terms of the sort of post-traumatic post stress type mm -hmm. symptoms, yeah. you, you said that it's really quite normal and to be expected yeah. and it happens to loads of people, but is there a, a particular sort of time limit? I mean, for most people in this room, you know, people are kind of beyond that stage, but certainly on the health line, we talk to people yeah. in their first year, and we don't know whether a year is six, six months or a year, or what, when would you expect? these symptoms to resolve? Is there a particular time when you sort of think you Nor really do need to seek help? Normally kind of in that acute phase, what we would say is um, to experience those symptoms for the first sort of four, four to eight weeks is, is normal and often things will settle by themselves during that time. Um, if it persists beyond that, then that's something that some like psychological intervention might be helpful. Um, but what we do know is that actually um, the traumatic stress symptoms can be re triggered by the pain spread down the line. So, actually, the child might adjust and do really well, um, and you not think that this has been that they've really been affected by traumatic stress. But when they come into hospital five years down the line or ten years down the line, actually, there's some memories there and some of that comes back. So, it's always worth just bearing and holding in the back of your mind as, as a possibility if you do notice changes in behaviour in children suddenly becoming distressed. Further down the line, it's always a possibility. It could be lots of other things as well. Does that answer your question? Excuse me. Yeah. We've had lots of kids fall, and all of a sudden she started doing saying to me when my legs and my hands go back. And that's part of the time. As I said, it's really normal that um, children, as they, as they grow in their understanding, the kind of questions they ask you will change. So she will probably be at an age where she's starting to notice that, that she might be a bit different. I was trying to explain that a lot when I go back and then she looks really upset. Because I know there are, I guess we could, I, it's probably easier if I catch you afterwards and we can have a chat about some suggestions about things that you can say to that. Um, I think it's really hard as a and then to answer those questions. And often some of the work that we will do is helping quick parents then be able to answer those questions because you need to be able to feel okay mm -hmm. and know what, what to say um, and what to be able to answer. Them. But I am around, so I'll catch you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I guess um, thank you very much, um, and. Uh, Introduce our next speaker, Richard Coxon, who's going to talk to you a little bit about sort of the issues in um, in terms of sort of the legal side of things and entitlement to um, care and and services. Um,
for children in situations like this. I'm coming at things from a slightly different angle. Obviously, I'm a lawyer, um, so I don't fall asleep just yet. But I'm hoping <laughs> in, in 15 minutes I can give you just a wee snapshot of some of the, the touchstones of the law and try and demystify some of those legal issues. Try and help you in day-to-day -day ways when you're looking to access care and support in the community. Um, I work over in Manchester, and my work's all about disability rights, as we call it, which is a big umbrella term for a lot of disparate areas of the law involving people who are vulnerable for one reason or another, or who are disabled, be they children or, or adults. And the, the law is, is very confusing at, at first glance, but there are certain key principles underpinning the areas of law that I work in, which are hugely important and which very often get overlooked in terms of day-to-day -day decision making by those who are responsible for making decisions about care and support. And what we're talking about is a bedrock of our work as a bedrock of access to care and support is community care, care in the community. Um, and included in that are services which are available to children. And the key, really, that I would want to get across to everybody is not to be spooked in any way by what it is the law and uh, dense amounts of guidance and regulations tell you is <coughs> potentially available in terms of what we call a child in need. And the cornerstone of uh, any legal principles and regulations and such like in terms of children who may need help and support and sometimes it's a very difficult issue to overcome in your own mind in terms of wanting to or needing to access some kind of care and support and it won't be for everybody not every child with difficulties and vulnerabilities will necessarily need support beyond that which hard working families and extended families can give them but bear in mind that there is a structure, a system, a legal system uh, which is implemented day on day in terms of care and support that's available out there in the community, the bedrock of which is the Children Act. The Children Act 1989 introduced at a time when there was great concern about how children's legislation as a whole was not being implemented properly by social services, and so the government of the day introduced a pretty chunky piece of legislation, the Children Act 1989, which sought to bring together lots of disparate areas of the law into one piece of legislation. Accompanying it was pretty chunky guidance as to how local authorities should uh, interpret and implement the Children Act. But that still remains the key in terms of the, the, the work that I do in trying to get care and support services for vulnerable children and their families. Because in the Children Act, in Section 17 in fact, you have this key principle of a child in need who may require care and support to promote and protect their health and well-being, essentially to enable them to live the independent life, the full life they deserve, with their families in the community. Now, large parts of the Children Act are geared towards the idea of child protection, but huge parts of it are based upon that very simple principle of a child in need. What is a child in need? Well, broadly speaking, as a child whose health and well-being is in some way likely to be or is being compromised for want of help and support. And so if you're approaching social services potentially nervously, you shouldn't be spooked about the idea of inquiring as to what it is social services may be able to do to protect a child in need who wants that full life in the community. Very often, certainly I encounter it day to day, social services telling people, oh no, we can't do that. Oh no, we have a policy which means that we don't provide services out of borough. Oh no, we haven't got the funds to do that. Well again, one important thing to get across for all those who might be wanting to access care and support is, uh, essentially, social services have immense power to provide whatever care and support services are necessary to meet the needs of a child in need under that piece of legislation and relevant guidance. And so what that means <coughs> is pretty much anything by way of support and assistance is on the agenda. It can be provided, it's just a question of whether they decide to actually provide it, which is very different to saying, oh no, we can't do that. Yes, you can, you're just choosing not to. So very often the area of dispute that we as lawyers deal with is that key decision about what it is they're deciding not to provide by way of care and support for a family who believe that they need some care and support to be able to ground them in the community after what we've seen are very traumatic and difficult times and often ongoing difficult and traumatic times. And so if somebody needs some kind of support to anchor them as a family and the child needs support in the community, 
Well, the Children Act is there as the foundation in terms of what can be provided. And that's aligned with various pieces of community care legislation. Now, I have produced some notes for you, um, which I've tried to keep as brief as possible because the law is pretty dense and sometimes very boring. I think it's fantastically interesting, but that's just me. In terms of like, practical uses for you, there are some key terms, <coughs> Section 17 of the Children Act. There's a fantastic piece of guidance which has been upgraded, which is this chunky document here, Working Together to Safeguard Children. This was introduced in March of this year and replaced what was previously the national framework. It's about 90 odd pages long, and like a lot of Department of Health guidance, it's full of like waffling nonsense. But in amongst all of it, there are some fantastic little pieces which give you like some, like some great little snapshots of common sense principles about how you interpret notions of care and support, and the idea of flourishing children living a full life in the community. Giving guidance essentially to social workers so that they know how to fulfil their role to carry out what's required in terms of assessing a child in need to potential need for care and support. <coughs> and the key is, is that the assessment has to be a thorough, comprehensive, child-centred assessment with all sorts of little touchstones as to how you best develop that procedure, all of which is very neatly set out in this guidance. It's worth a read if ever you're looking to access services from social services, because very often they're underpaid, overworked, pushed, firefighting, finding it difficult to actually so let's just pinpoint exactly what somebody wants. Largely, usually, for want of the time to sit down and go through things thoroughly in a very straightforward, common sense way, which would enable them to get a crystal clear picture of what that child and that child's family needs. It's not rocket science, it's relatively straightforward. If you take the time to gather together all the relevant evidence about that child's circumstances, be it from healthcare professionals, be it from family members, extended family, GP, anybody who provides care, uh, people who work with the child at school, for example, then you will be able to, in a very straightforward way, gain a crystal clear picture of that child's life, and thus what it is you think, in your professional capacity as somebody whose job it is to make a decision about what care and support they may need, what it is you think they need. And if you get the assessment right from the outset, you follow a relatively straightforward, reasonable, practical, common sense based approach to assessing, to get that clear picture, which the legislation and this guidance gives you sort of all the pointers to do, then you will get a crystal clear picture which enables you to get the foundation for a care package for that child so they can actually get that which the legislation and the guidance envisages they should get, a full life in the community with their family. So how do we go about dealing with difficulties with social services when they don't get the assessment right and or they make decisions which you disagree with in terms of, well, we do think that our son requires some care and support. We understand from the legislation that's available, which uh, for those of you who want to know, is Section 2 of the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act 1970. Um, uh, any number of care and support services are available. And by any number, I mean pretty much anything from direct physical assistance, hoisting somebody out of bed, through to supervision, through to respite, through to provision of holidays, through to any kind of practical assistance in the home. Whether or not social services can decide that that's necessary to provide support for a child in need is obviously an area of dispute, because social services obviously have a wide discretion in their professional capacity to make a decision scratching their chin as to whether that child needs those services. And that's obviously, as I said, often an area of dispute. But let's assume they've gone through the assessment process, they've got a clear or clearish picture of that child's circumstances, and they make a decision that they're not going to provide services at the level at which you think they should. What they're suggesting is going to get nowhere near providing enough that's going to enable you to sort of tick over, enable you to like ground yourself after a difficult time, to get you through, to give you a breather as care is for a vulnerable child, to enable you by way of respite for a couple of hours of an afternoon, for example, just to recharge your batteries so that you as parents and carers are better able then to provide the robust package of care which you as parents will need to provide for a child who's got greater needs usually than a child who hasn't got difficulties or disabilities. Well, what you're looking at, from my perspective, and bearing in mind that we don't want to go and see lawyers, we don't want to go to court, if you can avoid coming to see the likes of me, then heavens you should. And so what you want really is to be able to use this information in very sensible, straightforward, practical terms. The same way as I would use it in terms of the correspondence I write, which is not feisty, you don't have to shout if you've got a decent argument, 
Just spell it out straightforwardly. If needs be, gather the information and the evidence together yourself and put the case to social services to plug the gaps where they haven't done their assessment properly, haven't got that crystal clear picture, and as a consequence of not providing the care and support that your child or you as the parent of care need. So what we're looking at, essentially, when we are coming to argue about it, in terms of my view as a lawyer, is essentially common sense. And that's because we underpin all of our arguments on the basis of what we call public <coughs> law. Public law and human rights, that's the key to where it is we go in terms of our arguments with public bodies who've got discretion to make decisions about care and support. What does public law mean? Well, that's a long-standing common law principle of reasonableness, rationality, gathering together essential information so that you've got that crystal clear picture, so you're making an informed decision, and so you can properly exercise your discretion to be able to make a sound decision based upon all relevant evidence. And obviously, you don't need me to tell you that if social services are pushed, overworked, underpaid, firefighting, then they're going to miss things. They're not going to make rational decisions. They're not going to make well-informed decisions. They're going to make rushed decisions, which miss certain key information. And if they persist down that path, then ultimately, smarty pants lawyers like me send letters to them which say, look, we really don't want to go to court. We're giving you an opportunity of putting this right. We're going out of our way to gather together the information which you need. But if push comes to shove, then we would take legal proceedings. It would be based upon those public law principles. It would be based upon the idea, the simple idea, really, that you've had opportunity to do your job properly. It isn't difficult. It's common sense. The information, the structure is there for you to do your job properly. And you've chosen not to for whatever reason. And so what we want is a process by which the court, the judge in the high court, will quash any decision they've taken. And in doing so, tell them that they've acted unlawfully to go back to the drawing board and this time do it right. Yeah. Well, obviously, that's not an ideal remedy. That doesn't replace the decision with one by the court. What that does is play into the hands of a certain to and fro in terms of how we get the right decision, the decision that we want. And so there's no easy answer. But those are the principles that we have to work on. That's the legal structure we have to work within. And so we try and use it the best we can. And we do so in very straightforward, common sense ways, because that's what the law says we should all be doing. We don't want to have an argument, we don't want to go to court, we just want some care and support. And so we as lawyers only add on to the hard work that you as parents do, battling with people, pushing, pulling, negotiating, and sort of hoping that common sense will prevail. And so very often we're just finessing the very hard work that parents do. Sometimes to their chagrin, when we suddenly send a letter and we get something in terms of information which they've been battling to get for months, if not years. But so be it. These are the limitations of the system, these are the limitations of the law. And obviously, again, you don't need me to tell you that we're seeing more and more problems on our phone because of budget cuts and financially uh, driven decision making. But finances are only part and parcel of a much bigger picture when you have to balance those with the needs of the child. Why do you have to balance them? Because that's what's fair, that's what's reasonable, that's what is rational in terms of public law principles. Human rights plays a part as well. Human rights are much maligned in the press and by politicians, very unfairly so in my view. And from my perspective, it's absolutely essential to have as an undercurrent of the issues that you're talking about, a very healthy respect for human rights. These are rights which we as individuals, all of us, are enabled and empowered be able to like, push in terms of the arguments uh, that we put forward for those who have a role in the public to make public law based decisions. And so from my perspective, Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which by virtue of the Human Rights Act 1998, is now a right I can express to those who have a, a, a power to make decisions which impact upon me, that gives us all the right to respect for privacy and family life. Well, again, you can see the natural connection with the Children Act and the whole principle of keeping families together, protecting, promoting the health and well-being of a child in the community. We're looking to keep the family together. And so Article 8 is a cornerstone, again, of the principles underpinning what it is that the Children Act and the guidance and what we as lawyers are aiming to achieve for children who actually need care and support in the community. Fifteen minutes isn't a great deal of time. I could waffle on for hours about all of this. Uh, if anybody's got any questions at all about the issues that I'm talking about, and bear in mind that this is kind of left field in terms of the issues we're talking about today, um, then by all means catch me and, and, and ask me any questions. The only one thing that I, I, would, I, would, I would 
would sort of just say as a sort of final point, I think, is, is that sort of in, in attempting to deal with these issues yourself, you shouldn't be, sh be shy in any way about approaching social services on the basis of what it is I'm suggesting. Very often in terms of like sort of public law principles, as I say, what we are talking about is common sense. It's not difficult to find the legislation. It's not difficult to find the guidance now that we all have access to information on the internet. It's all easily accessible to the public. If we don't have access to the internet, then social services themselves have this information as a resource which is available to the public. You don't necessarily need this balance. You don't necessarily need the legislation. You don't have to have any great finesse to the correspondence that you write because essentially you as parents and carers have the very best picture your family, the very best picture of your child's difficulties. And again, common sense tells you that what you have to say as parents and parents is hugely, hugely important. Don't underestimate it at all. Not least because this very guidance indicates that you and your child are top of the list in terms of the people who should be listened to and who have a voice in the whole assessment process. Disappointing perhaps that it has to be written in black and white and guidance if that's the case. But again, common sense prevails. So a simple piece of correspondence followed up by the hard work that you very often have to do to get doors open, suggesting that you, as a parent and carer, believe that your child may benefit from the provision of whatever care and support you think to enable them to live that full and independent life in the community is all you need. You don't need fancy correspondence. You don't need a lawyer to be able to push that argument. The only time you'd ever need a lawyer is in desperation when you're looking for the last resort of how to get what it is that the law says that you have an opportunity, and I stress it in those terms, an opportunity of accessing via the legislation and guidance. What I have done, and I don't know if you've got access to it, I have drafted a wee template letter in, in the terms that I would write it as a solicitor. And I'm quite happy if you don't have it to circulate, but I think you've probably got it. Um, I purposely did that in, in, sort of in, in the style of a letter I would write, just so you've got a snapshot about like, how I would write it. But I hope that's useful in terms of you being able to adapt it. The structure of it is relatively straightforward. We don't say anything feisty. What we have to say is let's have an argument that we have as parents and carers, and we'd like somebody to listen to that. It's only in situations when you're not being listened to and, uh, and irrational and uh, nonsensical uh, arguments and decisions are being made that you'd ever really want to argue to any further. So, good luck. Thank you. Any questions? Fire away. <coughs> to the social services to ask for help, um, would they already have like an idea that we were in their community and, um, or, or would it, we just kind of go in there blind and say, look, I, I have a child like this and it might we, we need help? They know about, no. Um, I mean, without going into too much detail about the sort of comprehensive child-centred assessment, it, the Children Act does expand upon that in the sense that, sort of, that sort of, um, again, quite sensible if you're carrying out such an assessment to bring in all information from other sources. And so you would be expecting social services if they're told about a child with significant health problems to be contacting the clinical clinician group to get the information from them. It needs to be bring them into that assessment process if, for example, continuing health care issues or access to health care issues. Likewise, in terms of education, if there are any special educational needs issues, you would bring in the education department into that to let sort of yeah. comprehensive assessment of the social services holding responsibility is the, the assessor. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Sean, good. Yeah. Yes, yes, great. So, I think we've, we've still got time for a, a shortish panel discussion. Yeah, I think up to everyone who spoke with mine coming up the front, and then we can.
remember the question yeah. for, for you actually okay, around sure. sort of skin grafting yeah. and the fact that it's not as tough as normal skin. Yeah. Is there anything that can be done to make that a tougher bed for prosthetic to sort of so if you've got a limb that is constantly pounding into a prosthetic socket, no matter how good that fit is, it's obviously going to take a real beating over a period of a day. Is there anything that can be done to tighten that tissue or that graft up? Well, I don't think there is particularly. It's, uh, it will toughen up gradually over time. So, you know, I know I initially described the scar forming with a thin layer. Those cells will um, thicken up and the, the scar tissue does in itself toughen up a little bit. But there isn't anything that we can do that I know of that, that will, will make that more robust. What we usually find is, on the whole, if you keep the, the scar as um, well hydrated as possible, um, using moisturiser to prevent it from drying out, taking care to, to look for if you're getting any pressure areas that you, you get those covered and deal with them early, that's the, the best thing that you can do really. Sometimes you get little areas that are friable and, and continually break down, and if that happens and that's just a constant thing, um, and you, you're not in, in a position to be able to just completely rest that area of skin, then th there's options where you consider possibly you'd resurface part of part of the graft or an area that, that's friable. There may be other ways of bringing tissue in, but for the graft that's existing, that's there, there's not a lot we can do with it apart from just you know looking after it as, as well as possible. Yeah. In regards to um, the skin tissue being like a lot thinner and more delicate in areas where it's had scar damage, um, could that be also when I've, I've, we've noticed that um, when he seems to get a temperature or anything, his stumps where he's got a lot of scar damage, they seem to get very hot as well. Could that be something because the skin is a lot more sensitive in that area now? Well, I suppose the thing is, as a scar, if you like, is a, it, it, it's a, an always changing um, sort of thing. Really, it's not it's not fixed in time, so it will be affected by quite a quite a lot of things. So <coughs> it, it's likely to have more blood blood vessels within it than normal. So when you're you've got a temperature and your blood is circulating a little bit more. Um, vigorously perhaps, or, or the vessels are dilated a little bit because you're hot and you've got a temperature, then those areas will therefore feel a bit hotter. So right, yeah. in that way, it, it may be affected. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I mean, scars can be affected also by just the general condition of, of, um, of a person. So, you know, if you have, for example, say you've got scurvy, that people don't get scurvy nowadays, but that can cause scars to break down. So a lack of vitamins can... Mm -hmm. Uh, have an adverse effect on the scar, even though you think years and years later you think those, those scars are now as good as normal skin, they're, they're never quite as good as normal and they're still subject to the, the effect of the environment on them. But it's probably due to blood vessels an indirect answer to that. <coughs> services and, and local authorities knowing about them, we, we normally interact quite well with agents in the community because particularly when children leave hospital with amputations, there's often a lot of things that we need to do to uh, make things better at home. So our occupational therapy team, and maybe Alison I can ask you this as well, you, you'll normally be liaising with social services. Um, isn't, isn't that right? To sort of have ensure that those facilities are in place for a child. So I would on, on the whole expect that social services ought to be aware of, <coughs> of children and have a sort of good you know, understanding of, of what they require. Um, you're quite right on, on discharge from hospital, discharge planning and the link up. Um, and the idea of, I think, from your perspective, a safe discharge. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that like, social services would kick in with any services. I think it's, it's it's almost not necessarily a discharge that you would necessarily be looking for any kind of care and support. It's perhaps later in the day when some of those have looked at in the family life settled and so on, so they've got difficulties in terms of. Um, I would expect ordinarily that there are adaptations issues at discharge and they would be addressed mm -hmm. in social services. But in a sense, I see adaptations are only one part of the much bigger panoply of the services that are available. So there has to be a joint work and there has to be joint I think where we've struggled with that is um, it's <coughs> uh, cross counties 
because we were admitted to um, at Airedale Hospital then transferred to Leeds but we're still under a lot of the Leeds care and then we've got put back to Airedale but Airedale's Yorkshire but we actually live in Lancashire so I think we have a lot of problems there where it's all crossed over because um, whereas I went to the OTs to ask for help about household adaptations I asked them in the Airedale bit where we go for physio but they said they can't help us because we don't live in Yorkshire so they've then had to refer us over to other people so that's where my question of social services in my area if I was to walk in through their door and speak to them they might not even know about us because of all them cross county things that we seem to have problems with the thing so. I mean, we found we six years ago so so you can chat to me, you cock up. And I think we found that there was um, quite a lot of disparity between, um, we had a really good relationship with the hospital OTs and, and the team there getting them out to discharge. And then we had a reconfiguration with the PCTs in our area, who suddenly would do all paediatric support services. So we had no occupational therapy, we had no physio, we had no CAM support. Um, and what we got, we got through um, Miss Davis's supporting us um, from Manchester. Now we live in Preston. So, you know, we had a very, very difficult time where we'd started hydrotherapy with Sophia. And then three weeks after she'd started and making really good process, progress, we then ended up with no physio services whatsoever because of the, the PCT and their budget. Um, so, you know, I can really appreciate where, where Julie is there because it's really difficult because you have really good systems in place when you get home and you feel really comfortable about them and then all of a sudden that's removed. Um, and, you know, we're fortunate now. We've got a really good prosthetic service in, in Fergus who was here this morning, but it wasn't always like that, was it? <laughs> you know, and we had to we had a, a bit of a battle. I think it's interesting how long some of these battles take though as well. I mean, we yeah. don't have a perfect health service. I think we've got a bit of a responsibility to sort out as clinicians to try and help some of these cross-border issues. Um, and, you know, I mean, what you'll be surprised at is what happens once you turn 16 is that all the services change again and actually, unfortunately, get better. Um, and the children's services still aren't where they should be. Um, but all of this takes a huge amount of time and children's needs are changing over that time. And I guess, you know, it, 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 there's a part to play in this. Is that, you know, what's the fastest way of sorting this out seems to be the answer sometimes because people can spend years battling um, and it can focus so much of your mind trying to do that. And when actually what you need to do is get on with your life. And, you know, if somebody had a little switch that said, no, we can sort this out now, that would be what, you know, we'd all look for for our patients. I wish there was an easy answer, but she was so it isn't. It's the sanctuary, simply because um, everything is so open to interpretation from my, my perspective. But what is fair, what is reasonable, what's a sound, balanced exercise of expression, and it's so open to interpretation. And very often, um, a court would view it from the perspective of um, is that decision within what we call a range of reasonable responses? I mean, is it so irrational or perverse as to be such no way to as far as we possibly make that decision? It's a very difficult to overcome. So it's sort of day-to-day issues in terms of the quality of the balance of the decision. When you've got quite fundamental failings in terms of not gathering the information together, <coughs> and yes, of course, you've got quite strong arguments to get them to look again at that, which is essentially what Paul called them to do. There's a lot of like toing and froing in that because judicial review is not like, an ideal remedy. It's not like being able to go and get a court injunction compelling somebody to do anything. So, but it's a pretty hefty lever to get social services to do their job properly when they've not done it properly in the first place, that's for sure. Um, and so if parents are struggling to actually get a social worker or a complaint to be listened to, then certainly that's in terms of the arguments, the issues, the, sort of the threat of it is something that's quite powerful. Whether you get the right decision or not, that's a little bit Just very quickly on the point you're making, that's sort of, um, that you perhaps have said that that's sort of Section 17 duties are to do with the child in their local authority area. Yeah. It's a little difficulty you've had with Airedale. And, you know, they, they may be involved in health care issues, but in terms of like Community Care Children Act uh, issues, that's definitely the local authority in the area you hear. Okay, thank you. Can I just ask Richard a question? The physiotherapy that needs so I'm not like a parent. 
Uh, but the problems that seem to have had with some of the children is when they're moving from primary school to secondary school. And often the situation is the school nearest where their friends are going is not a suitable school for that mm. child or is deemed that way. And they have to move out of area, which seems extremely unfair to the child. Is there any legal obligation for that school actually to provide the facilities for that child? Um, <coughs> I'm not a whiz on education, special education, on these, my colleagues are. And I always defer to them in terms of, I mean, there's a very specific call in regards to <coughs> having a parent, and by all means, just give me a shout out. It would be more of the general mobility for the distance um, and lifts and things. As you probably know, under the Equality Act 2010, there are quite significant provisions which are essential <coughs> to uh, promote the idea of equality amongst those who've got protected characteristics, which, which would include a child with a disability, <coughs> regardless of the disabled as under the Act, which is relatively straightforward in terms of the final. So if you are a disabled person and you're not able to access education in the same way as someone who isn't disabled would do, for example, if you wanted reasonable adjustments to the environment in which you're to be educated, just as you might struggle to get into your bank premises because there isn't a ramp, for example, then you have a perfectly sound argument in the Equality Act that the local authority education department should be going the extra mile to look into what they believe to be reasonable in terms of adjustments. Mm. Well, if you're not able to access your local school in the same way as your mates from primary school are, well, simply by virtue of your disability, then isn't that going to be something akin to direct discrimination? Mm. Shouldn't the education authority be thinking again on different lines? Because I think it's a perfectly reasonable adjustment depending upon any number of different factors. And again, we're into what's reasonable. We're into discretion. We've actually been told that about our adversity and access. The local secondary school, and I, I so she said, Look, she's one further away. And when I've asked the question, well, Can will transport be provided? Where I've got two other younger mm. children at primary school, so I then can't be taking her to secondary school. Mm. Well, the point there is that's just to come back to like, it can be done. The question is, Should it be done? We say, Yes, it should. They will say, What? Mm. What's the reason for your decision? From my perspective, the why is very important. Why have you made that decision? Can you please just point it out? Because um, they do have the power to provide transport to school for those who need it by virtue of their disability, for example. <coughs> so they need it's reasonable to expect transport to be provided for a child who wouldn't otherwise be able to access education. So it can be provided. If they're not providing it, then what's the reason for that? Because in a sense, you're barring access to education. And saying all of this, bearing in mind that like, so you're having this how many issues about access to your local school department in terms of numbers. And so, leaving that aside, uh, if we're talking about an issue in terms of access to your local school which is related to a disability and not addressing that, then that is something which I think parts back to this whole discrimination and transport can be provided. decision-making process, this time the PCT, not the local authority. Again, from my perspective, there are lots of internal procedures you can uh, utilise. <coughs> I'm talking about the complaints procedure, not to be sniffed at, I should hasten to add, in terms of its potential for revenue and things. And the NHS has its own internal review and complaints procedures. But if ultimately the PCT is saying no, we don't believe that that's a cause for provision of services. That's a decision akin to social services exercising the same level of discretion. And again, ultimately, it's public law principles. Is that reason? Is that rational? Well, it's a much starker picture in some ways in the NHS, where lots of people will boldly say, I'm sorry, we don't have the budget to fund that level of uh, health care service. Um, 
And from my perspective, well, okay, we have to accept that public bodies have got to manage the limited funds that they have. We have to accept that, and not just because of these difficult times, but that's part and parcel of their job. You know, to best utilise limited funds so that the maximum number of people have access to health care or, or social care. But it's not simply the finances. It has to be a decision which is taken with full view, full knowledge of what it is that person needs in terms of, in that instance, health care or community care. And again, the NHS is prone to make the same areas of social services for want of time to be able to get a third assessment done. And so if you were tackling that, you would tackle on exactly the same basis, really roping in like some very helpful uh, medical professionals. So, you know, politely internally a challenge that which has been decided as well. How easy that is, I don't know. Well, it's, very, it's very difficult because if you've got, depends who your opponent is. And um, if they're kind of, you know, a pushover, then you can write sloppy letters and that works. But if it's someone who asks me, show me your evidence, then I'm struggling because it's not the sort of thing you can provide evidence for. And therefore it becomes very difficult in, in very objective terms to, to support, apart from it, it, it's it's common sense and it works and you see it work, but that doesn't really seem to carry much weight. What I'm finding these days is that what would have almost a sort of a, 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 a stern but fair letter is now being blocked by people saying, you know, trying to make it into science, which it isn't. Mm. And I think that's a very sinister development and I find it difficult to, I, I have no evidence, mm. there is no evidence, but that doesn't mean it's not good. Well, this is, I mean, this is increasingly political and yeah. uh, argument, isn't it? And we're all in a position at the moment where we're, you know, members of CRGs and nice guys are coming along, and uh, everybody's wanting evidence for everything that we do. And it's not going back, unfortunately, to common sense. And I wonder, uh, especially with specialist commissioning, whether, in fact, those services will be available, but not locally. Um, and that what you'll be asking for is, is you know, a way of getting to services that are distant, um, because they are... You know, so you know, we will become more and more specialised, um, and it might be that we need to take a different track, and it isn't local like services won't provide the answer for you. I think it's where it may be where forums like this are quite useful because if everybody communicates with each other about <coughs> what difficulties they've had and what successes they've had, then that's very useful for other people because it's a backup to say it's provided here, here, and here. Then. But the foundation has a role in all of this, and, and all of these people are looking for lay members or stakeholders to be involved. And I think it is important that these views are gathered together, and that you know the, the guys in Clifford can do their bit. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favourite part. <laughs> Thank you. One of the things that will uh, focus people's attention in the health sector is. It's one to say, you know, how much money will this cost if they stay in hospital compared to being outside? And to the quality of life. So if you can show that quality of life is improved by various things, then that normally, if they're asking for evidence, that's the lever you can use sometimes to get them in. But, but it's getting more difficult, isn't it? You're right. It's in the old days, a stroppy letter, mm -hmm. it's great, you can write it off, oh, and yeah, that's and quite get, a people would do it. You go, Ooh, it would be fixed, but that's not good. It's got to have power. It depends on how you wield it. It's targeting the right people and the exactly. right way of approaching it, and you're like, just, just being stuffy isn't actually good enough these days, is it? You have to put a, a reasonable thing in there, but those things like quality of life and you know, being in the community and then especially things like the children that just push those things further than them. Just then I'll get on with it. Yeah, I mean, so it needs to say as a lawyer, evidence is key to any amount of time. But to them, that said, like, so it can be cumulative in terms of like, so, you know, a growing body of opinion, you know, as to whereby um, when they're asking you, like, why, what's your evidence base? Well, sometimes there isn't an evidence base to the contrary. And so if you're building up a body of opinion and evidence where basically you're starting to like sort of create a doubt as to whether it is reasonable and so on and so forth, then just like rigidly following the line for want of an alternative argument which counters something which might not be strong in the first place, would, from my perspective, in terms of where we'd ultimately go, you know, we'd go off to the High Court with, well, let's have it straight, you know, an, an ably conservative bunch of old, old men, basically, like sort of having like, what might be perceived as being an old school notion of like, sort of what is fair and reasonable. Well, even you might be able to tip 
to their minds in the right way, if you're looking at that sort of something approaching that sort of wall and everything, you know, that's the closest you can get to it. But it still has to be something so perverse, so unreasonable that you no know, sound for the body can make that decision. That's always been hard. It's very, very difficult when you're a parent in the situation like we've all been here to be totally unemotional and, you know, I, I, I was a nurse, you know, I was a senior nurse. It was very difficult for me to take that hat off and become a mum, but it was also very difficult for me not to be able to react as a, a, as a DON and, you know, take some people out along the way. So I'm sure Mr. Davis will, will tell you I did. But, it, you know, to, to get into that situation where you, you are trying to get things for your children, you know, you're also very tired, you're very, very emotional, you know, and I really do feel for this young, I'm getting so what's up? I really feel for her at the front, because we went through that with our little girl. Um, to try and put all of those things in place, and then you've got other children to care for, you know, you're trying to, to maintain a career, you're trying to run a home, you're trying to keep everything together. And to then have to fight a battle with social services, or a PCT, or your local community physio services, it's very difficult to do and be rational about it. Mm -hmm. And you know, so this is the whole point of, of the charities to try and support people. But you know, I know myself. You know, it was a, it was, I wasn't in a good place when I found the charity, and I needed that support before then. And to try and battle for those things for your children and get them in place when you need them when you get home and you start to realise how much more you need them. It's very, very difficult and there should be more of a support mechanism from the social services and the local authorities mm -hmm. and the community paediatric services. Right. I think it's a reminder as well about how important um, a role of advocacy is for a, an organisation, isn't it? Because that's, that's what you need. You need those people who can provide support to you on one hand but also provide this passionate services on the other hand and yeah. sort of be the, the body that has that reasonable yeah. voice and you know you're lucky well I, I say lucky but yeah. you, you have you had an advocate there yeah. in the health professional yes. who was able to act on your behalf yes. and get those services yeah. but you, you know that that's not a good system is it whereby you've got to rely on finding somebody who yeah. is going to support you and, and maybe not all parents are are um, able to do that's that right. So I suppose it's, it's just saying that really the organisation should be mm. well known throughout all hospitals and professionals mm. who deal with, with children who do that and loss so that they can sort of increase the profile mm. so that parents will have access to those Maybe services. Maybe something like um, a pack, like a hospital leaving pack or something. It's funny you should mention that. I Shall I make a start on that? So yeah, NICE well. are a uh, variable body, but they do a variety of things, and one of which is to put down quality standards. So there are now 20, no, what do we make? 17. 14? 17, I think. I don't know. Linda and I were on the group who put some quality standards down for meningitis and meningococcal disease, one of which is that parents should be given some information on leaving hospital about the condition mm -hmm. and about what to expect. So uh, MOF, together with Meningitis Trust and the College of Pediatric and Child Health, have put together such a pack which has information about after effects and uh, the little slim <coughs> version and, and then the, the full uh, on version if you really want it, isn't there, with lots of extra bits mm -hmm. and a diary for people to put stuff in, partly to help them go through what's going on and provide their appointments and bits and pieces and put those out. So that should be available to everybody who's had an intercorporate yeah. meningitis on discharge from hospital. Yeah. So it should be ready in June. Is exactly. that coming out? Yeah. Yeah. That's tomorrow. I didn't mention which year. <laughs> 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 but, but that's a fantastic opportunity to, to get that sort of information out. So we're going to try to do that. I mean, so we put it in the nice quality standards that those are going to become the thing that people are measured by. So people are going to have to start doing that. And there's something produced by both the Royal College and by the many United Charities to actually have. So it's easy to do. It's all there. They don't have to say, okay, here's the stuff about the disease. These are the sort of things you might want to know. If you want more information, these are the people to contact. So we're trying to fill that in, that opportunity is there for people to do it. Because we are, that's the problem. 